Hi, everybody, and welcome. We're just going to give it one more minute here to see if people are joining, if people are going to still join, and then we're going to get started right away because we have so much important information to, um, to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and get started and um, people will still join in and, and that's perfect and um, I hope I hope they continue to join in. Um, I, I wanted to say to everybody welcome um, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day for joining us today for such an important discussion. Um, I am Alicia Stillman. I am the director of the Emily Stillman Foundation and the co-director of the Meningitis B Action Project. And on behalf of my partner, Patty Wukovitz and myself and Mariana Rodriguez, who you will meet, uh, and also Sydney, who works with us, uh, we thank you very much for being here today. The topic we're going to be discussing is meningitis prevention is changing and to learn how you can prepare. And I wanted to wish you all a happy meningitis day today and um, wishing it's one of our last meningitis days that we ever have to acknowledge. How's that? Um, it's sad that we have to even have a meningitis day, but but we do, so um, welcome. The agenda today is I'm going to give you a brief overview of um, what we're dealing with now. I'm going to share why it is such an important topic to myself and to my partner, Patty. And then we're gonna move right into the information. You're going to hear from Dr. Amy Middleman. You're going to hear from um, the Shelly Udani, and then you're going to hear from Tosin, who, who is the medical director at GSK, and also uh, Oscar. And then there's going to be a really, really important panel discussion um, where we hope everybody participates. And Amy Pisani, the chief executive officer of Vaccinate Your Family, will be joining us for that part. So buckle your seatbelts because there's going to be a lot of information coming at you um, fast and furiously and um, use your chat box for questions. But of course, at the end, if you just have questions, raise your hand and we can discuss. We don't know if we'll have the answers, but maybe somebody will. So on the left side of the screen, this is my daughter, Emily, and this is why I do what I do. In 2013, my daughter was a college sophomore at a small liberal arts college in Michigan, and she called home with a headache one night. The next day, my daughter was declared brain dead. They told me she had bacterial meningitis. I was shocked. I kept saying she can't have bacterial meningitis. My daughter was vaccinated for bacterial meningitis. I had never even heard of MenB at that time. And I considered myself to be an educated, proactive mother. And so if I hadn't, I thought, oh my God, many others hadn't either. And that is when I created the Emily Stillman Foundation. Around a similar time frame, my partner, who you will see on the right side of the screen, Patty Wukovitz, had a high school senior. Her symptoms were different. She presented differently. She presented with... Um, actually, Patty saw her petechiae coming out. She started with a fever and a headache, and she also was diagnosed with bacterial meningitis. My daughter ended up only having um, meningococcal disease, and Patty's daughter had meningococcemia. So when we got together and created the Meningitis B Action Project, we 
do really well when we tell our stories together because they're similar and that both girls died, both girls were vaccinated with ACWI, but not B because it wasn't available at that time. But yet their presentation was so different. Their symptoms were so different. One was college, one was not. And so it complements each other very well. And it's become the educational arm to both the Emily Stillman Foundation and the Kimberly Coffee Foundation. So when we give our presentations, um, even though we are called the Meningitis B Action Project, we address both vaccines. We address comprehensive protection against all meningococcal um, serogroups that are preventable. In our main message, we show this twice when we give a presentation, at the beginning and at the end, is that it takes two separate vaccination series to be protected. It takes the men ACWY vaccine, which is currently recommended at age 11 with a booster dose at 16 or 17. And it takes a men B series, which is given beginning at 16. Many people do comply and are vaccinated with the first dose of ACWI. Vaccine compliance does drop with the second dose as all adolescent vaccines do. And so the men B vaccine, the compliance with that is even lower. Part of it is the fact that it's an adolescent vaccine and a big part of it is so many people still don't know about it. They're not talking about it. And the ACIP's recommendation is so unfortunate um, in that it is confusing for the medical professionals and parents alike. The impact of this is that um, the at the eighty percent of all parents don't even know about the men B vaccine. Seventy percent of all meningococcal cases in the United States are among sixteen to twenty three year olds, and they are men B. A hundred percent of all college outbreaks since twenty eleven are caused by men B. But I want to be very careful to say that both my daughter and Patty's daughter were not part of outbreaks because of the majority of cases are still the one-offs. Only three of 10 17-year-olds have even received their first dose of the Men B vaccine, and even less have received the follow-up vaccine. College students are five times more likely than non-college students to receive the vaccine. I mean, to contract men B, but yet very few colleges have started to use it to mandate it. And we're at a turning point now in, in our landscape uh, because right now the pentavalent is on our horizon. But remember, not all providers are even talking to their patients about the men B vaccine. There's confusion among providers about the ACIP recommendations for the men B vaccine. Few colleges are even educating about it or requiring it. And there are significant gaps in the equitable access for adolescents and adult vaccinations. And of course, as we all know, COVID-19 has permanently reshaped public trust in vaccinations. And right now, it's so important that we all get on the same page because there are two, currently two investigational pentavalent meningococcal vaccinations that will cover A, B, C, W, and Y. And we are expecting in October, uh, that the ACIP is going to give a recommendation on the Pfizer pentavalent vaccine and how that, how what they determine is going to input and affect everything above that I just talked about is so important.
And now I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Amy Middleman, and she is going to talk about the latest news in the meningococcal vaccinations. Right, great, well, thank you. My ability to move things forward just disappeared. So that's just so you know, first of all, I wanna say thank you so much um, to the Meningitis B Action Project for having me speak. And, and if you haven't been to their website, I, I strongly recommend that you do because it's just really beautifully done and, and portrays um, the issues quite well. Um, so if we could move forward, um, and I will say I don't have any, I, I, I thank you. <laughs> so I've been tasked with um, providing some disease rates, some current disease rates, some current vaccination rates. Um, I wanted to just sort of look at VFC orders. We did a little bit of work on how to approach um, shared clinical decision making, which is the way that um, men B vaccine is recommended. And then just talk very briefly about the pentavalent vaccine on the horizon um, in terms of what's happening on the ACIP scene um, so far. So if we could move forward. Um, so this slide is actually from um, the ACIP meeting in February. And it's been hard to get a lot of data from 2019 through 2022. So some of the data that was presented was from 2000 up to 2019 and some was to up to 2022. And of course the reason for that is the pandemic. But this really nicely illustrates the fact that luckily, thank goodness, meningococcal disease incidence has been going down and has been going down steadily in this country. Um, and then really went down when we all started wearing masks and staying inside and not communicating too much with each other. But it does look as though from 2020 to 2022, there is a bit of an uptick in um, disease. And so I think this is really this has really become a wait and watch scenario in terms of what's gonna happen with disease incidents. We just don't know what's gonna happen with disease incidents from meningococcal disease post pandemic. And that's gonna be something that we really need to watch carefully. Next slide, please. So this is the disease incidence by zero group. And this is where you can really start to see um, after it sort of went down around the pandemic, you can see towards the 2021, 2022, we're seeing this little bit of an uptick. C has gone up. There have been a couple of outbreaks that I think have really um, contributed to that, but um, and, and as well as with Y, but we're, we're seeing it sort of, you know, just slightly um, across the zero groups. If you could go to the next slide, please. There have been some recent shifts um, in epidemiology for meningococcal disease um, just in general. And um, one of the things that was presented recently was that there is now some antibiotic resistance to N. meningitidis, which in the past has been very rare. They have seen some penicillin and ciprofloxacin resistance um, among some serogroup Y cases that were detected in 2020. And, and this, anytime you see antibiotic resistance, it's obviously um, of concern. The largest outbreak um, from January, 2022 to the present has been a zero group C outbreak, primarily among men having sex with men. Again, interestingly, um, the case fatality rate is a little higher than we've seen in the past as well. And then, um, in a recent outbreak from June 2022 to the present um, with um, a strain of zero group Y, 27% of the 11 cases reported have died. Um, and this, these outbreaks are were ongoing as of February, I can say. I have not seen much since then at that time. So clearly we need more data, um, certainly from 2021 to 2022, um, more data are coming in. Um, and so it's going to be really important, again, to sort of track these sort of changes and shifts that we're seeing after the pandemic. Thank you. Yes. Next slide. Wonderful. Um, so these are the vaccines that are recommended for adolescents, and these are the rates of coverage as of the, as of actually fairly newly off the press from 2022 data for teens. Um, the vaccination rates are, I mean, we can always do better with that. Well, you know, with vaccination rates ideally are 100 percent. Right. But the sort of healthy people 2000 target for some of these adolescent vaccines is 80 percent. And we're getting close with the one dose, <laughs> but we're not getting close 
with series completion. So what I will say is if you look towards the left side of the bar graph, we're doing pretty well actually with uh, one dose of men ACWY. Um, and well, and 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 not as well with the completion of the series, obviously, which is necessary to continue to protect kids into their late teens. So this is something we obviously need to do a lot of work on. The men B rates are are lower, and uh, and you would expect that because it's not a routinely recommended vaccine at this time, and um, so it really does rely on both provider and parent. Um, awareness and understanding. I think that's what we're really addressing today, right? I mean, that we need to increase awareness so that we can increase rates. Um, not quite yet, I'm sorry. I just wanted to sort of point out a couple of things. Um, if we could go back one slide, the, the one dose rate for men ACWY that you saw, um, that sort of, I think it was 89%. Um, it, it is important to recognize that that's sort of overall the rate, um, but it does vary by state. And the lowest rate was 55.5% in Mississippi and a highest of 97.9% .9 in Iowa. And so, I, you know, I just point this out so people don't become complacent with the 89%. That doesn't mean it's 89% in your area. And we all have a lot of work to do, right? The other thing, I wanted to point out is that the men B one dose is 29%. The number for two doses, and granted, this only looks at immunization rates up to age 17, right? So it's not, I mean, sometimes people need a longer period of time to complete series, but the two dose rate is about 12%. So again, we do need to do some work to complete these, um, these, 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 get these rates up. OK, I'm sorry. Now we can go to the next one, which is really just um, a slide to show you that um, trends are lagging behind pre-pandemic levels. And um, in terms of just the public doses or VFC orders, um, HPV in particular is low. And what I can say is that the birth cohort, the 2008 birth cohort, which would have turned 12 in 2020, right, around the time of the pandemic, um, they actually have lower immunization rates than the other cohorts, and they have not yet rebounded. So they still have lower rates than the other co cohorts. And this is something we really have to keep in keep an eye on. The, the same um, dip was not seen for the, for the uh, 2009 birth cohort. Um, and and we really need to work on getting these folks back up. Also, VFC provider orders, as you can see from here, are start, starting to rebound for all of the vaccines with the exception of HPV. Uh, I'm not sure why um, it hasn't rebounded for HPV, but I think that's also something to, that we need to follow closely and watch. But luckily we're seeing um, men B doses and men ACWY vaccine doses being ordered again at higher and higher rates, which will help us recover. Next slide, please. So again, this just reiterates the orders and it's just another pictorial way to, to, to view the fact that um, orders were down in 2020. Obviously you can see that in the graph. Um, and then orders are starting to pick up um, 21, 22, and then in 23, obviously, you know, they do have to pick up more, right, to catch up. So um, they're starting to do that for men B vaccine. And if you can um, go on to the next slide, you'll see that that is also happening with the men ACWY vaccines. We're starting to pick back up, not quite there yet all the way, but starting to pick back up. Okay, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, I We did a study actually over the um, pandemic, and we really wanted to get a sense of people's, uh, mostly parents, um, feelings about the importance of, of vaccines for teens. And I think there is a misconception as parents ask questions that they don't necessarily think vaccines are important. And I actually think this these data show us that that's not actually what's happening. If you look at the parental rating of the importance of vaccines for teens, you can see that there is 
um, very high rating, a very high rating for the importance of all of the adolescent vaccines, including the meningococcal vaccines and including the MenB vaccine. I think parents do feel that these vaccines are very important. The MenB vaccine um, actually surpasses the HPV vaccine. Now, there are some issues around the HPV vaccine and COVID influenza that we, we know about and, and um but I think that's really important for us to understand because parents do think this is important. They do want to know more about it. And that really needs to guide where we go with this. Um, next slide, please. So um, we we created an education piece a couple of years ago. Of course, right before COVID, the timing could not have been worse. <laughs> but we created a, um, a meningococcal shared clinical decision-making education piece that um, we provided to um, medical personnel and providers. And it included similar information on, with, on tear off sheets that we could hand to patients so that this was always in the patient room and patients could tear off the sheets and take them themselves. Hopefully the provider addressed it. It made it easier for the provider to address these um, this particular vaccine because it included just two or three bullets of information on key uh, key points related to the target disease, um, two or three important bullets about the safety and efficacy of the available vaccines, and then reasons one would want to be vaccinated, which of course ultimately includes preventing disease, right? <laughs> so um, we did find that providers really valued these educational materials for both themselves and for their families. Um, it also showed us uh, during this, we also found that some providers are actually recommending the MenB vaccine with a presumptive approach, which means they're uh, assuming that the patient will want the vaccine. But in terms of just starting the conversation, um, these materials were found to be helpful um, from the perspective of um, from the perspective of the providers. Um, next slide, please. This is um, this is the sort of entree into what's on the horizon. So there is a pentavalent vaccine. It's expected to be discussed this coming meeting, I believe. I actually haven't seen the agenda. Someone else probably knows what where it is on the agenda. But um, the pentavalent vaccine has been in, in um, development for a while, and um, it has been tricky, I think, uh, for people to try and figure out how to integrate this into the current um, immunization schedule. So there are several options, and there they are the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth options in this table. So the first two options are standard of care, um, and you can see that the first column, thank you so much for using that arrow, that is really helpful. Um, the 11 to 12 year old dose is currently a quadrivalent with the quadrivalent um, boost at 16 years of age. And then the standard of care that integrates both vaccines is in the second row, right? Quadrivalent, quadrivalent plus by, by men B and then men B. Um, the first PICO question for um, for ASIP was to use the men ACWI as um, in the middle as an option for the the in between the quadrivalent, then give the pentavalent, then give the monovalent men B. And you can see the other options were pentavalent, pentavalent B, quadrivalent, pentavalent, pentavalent, and then pentavalent, pentavalent, pentavalent. pentavalent. And as as in most things. Um, the cost effectiveness analysis um, became a big driver in the recommendation. Um, what they did find was, and and the pro the other problem is that the the cost of vaccinating has gone up with the decrease in rates, right? So the dollars per quality saved. That's sort of how they talk, but basically it's a way to sort of look at things comparatively. Um, the cost went up as rates of disease went down. But what they did find was that the third PICO question, PICO one, sorry, the third row down was found to really be a desirable option. And it would actually incrementally be cost saving relative to the standard of care. And so 
Um, my suspicion is that that is where things will be focused as we move forward, but it is a great way. I'm just gonna say the use of the pentavalent is a great way to um, sort of uh, merge the two um, vaccination strategies in a way that hopefully will help promote full vaccination. And I think it's, I, I, it's going to be confusing from a practical perspective to carry three different vaccines. But I think from, um, from the from the from the analyses, I think this is where where the the train is headed. So if we go to the next slide, uh, just to summarize, rates of meningococcal disease did drop during the pandemic, but are rising again. And we just have to sort of watch carefully and see what's happening with the epidemiology as well as the the rates in different populations. We're still playing catch up with meningococcal vaccine doses that were missed during the pandemic, but we're doing a pretty good job. Parents clearly understand the importance of meningococcal vaccines. I think this is really important to take in with us in each room that they do feel it's important. We just need to um, educate um, and have really clear discussions about, about vaccination. There are educational materials available to initiate these discussions and the materials I described are available on the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine website if you'd like to um, print some of them. And recommendations will likely change with the approval of the pentavalent meningococcal vaccines, but I am not in the business of predicting too terribly much. So um, I don't, you know, I if I lose more than $35 in Vegas, I start to cry. So I will not be predicting what will happen. So. Um, so that's it. And um, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Middleman, and will be really kind of great overview of the landscape as it stands today. And we'll dive into some of the topics a little bit more during our panel discussion as well. But thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Vaishali, who's going to share with us results of a survey um, that was conducted by her group that looked specifically at how meningococcal immunization is being used in, in clinical practice. So Vaishali. Thanks so much, Mariana, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be presenting the findings from the physician survey on the perceptions of meningitis vaccine, which was commissioned by Pfizer earlier this year. Um, now, before I dive into the results, just method-wise, uh, this study was really uh, designed to evaluate provider preferences, uh, identify gaps in the current understanding, and also explore insights based on experiences and perceptions of physicians who routinely recommend and provide the meningitis vac vaccine to their adolescents' patients. Uh, the research also uncovered physicians' expertise and familiarity with the vaccine administration process, as well as their observations of patient responses. So, uh, you know, in addition to the impact of COVID-19 and how that has changed. Uh, it also offers broader insights into the pentavalent vaccine, which is currently in development uh, and it, which has the potential to streamline the immunization schedules and enhance vaccine adoption to a large extent. For this particular survey, we had a total of 400 physicians participate, and we had we had a representation from across primary care physicians, pediatricians, and family doctors across the U.S. The next slide. Now for the results, um, you know, as we a key area we delved into was vaccine recommendations, and what we see is that uh, physicians surveyed demonstrate a strong knowledge of the current ASAP recommendations for men for the meningitis vaccine. 80% of the physicians cor uh, correctly recognized the ACIP recommendation for routine men ACWI immunization, and they were half as likely to correctly recognize the recommendation of men B was based on shared clinical decision making, which is a stark contrast there. 60% of the physicians um, consistently recommended the men B vaccine. And when it came to uh, entry requirements for school and colleges, only half of the physicians were familiar with their school uh, you know, and state college entry requirements for both men B and men ACW vaccines. So for in instance, the familiarity for men B was at 47% and for men ACW, it was slightly higher at 55%. Um, you know, all the physicians that were surveyed kind of unanimously agreed on the significance of the MENBI vaccination and having those discussions early on with the parents, with 95% of them emphasizing its importance. For the next slide. 
We also wanted to take a look at what COVID-19 had done to parents and how that impacted their decision-making process. And um, what, we, what we see is that, not surprising, what we observed is a significant shift in parental opinions uh, and the decision to get their child vaccinated. On the slide, you will see uh, you know, some of the factors that are a concern for parents when it comes to vaccinating their children for both men B and men ACWY vaccines. I think what we see is that physicians reported that the parents are considering the specific benefits of the vaccine, but are equally important, be worried about the potential side effects when deciding to vaccinate their child. Uh, there is a growing concern among parents, and it appears to stem from the general lack of awareness uh, about the recommended vaccines and a, a lack of trust in the medical community when it comes to recommendations. Next slide. Shifting years, we also explored physicians' preferences uh, for the new pentavalent vaccine, which is currently in development. And what we found is that the pentavalent vaccine is viewed as a highly promising vaccine. And majority of them perceive it uh, to significantly increase immunization rates for men whenever it, it comes out. Almost all say that they were likely to highly recommend this vaccine and believe that parents will have a strong preference uh, for one vaccine that contains a 5-0 groups when compared for the two uh, separate vaccines. There seems to be a widespread consensus that the pentavalent vaccine will greatly streamline and enhance the efficiency across the various touch points. So be it from the initial recommendations that they make for the parents or uh, through scheduling, stocking, and also from an administration standpoint. And now for the last slide. When we look at the vaccine administration and their access to information and resources, what we see is that almost all physicians surveyed kind of prefer to administer the men B and men ACWY vaccine in their uh, clinics or uh, hospitals rather than providing referrals. Um, they generally are express satisfaction with the overall administering and stocking process, but there was a clear opportunity to improve financial reimbursements uh, for those who administer the vaccine on site. Um, additionally, while they believe they were all well informed and had sufficient information uh, to routinely recommend the men B and men ACWI vaccine, I think only a third felt that they had enough information to engage in a shared clinical decision making with parents. I know there's a lot of data out there, and I will leave you with that a clear thought that you know we have some clear next steps in terms of how we should be proceeding further when when the pentavalent vaccine comes comes by. There is a lot of data that is available, um, and I believe the copy of the detailed findings is on the MenB Action Project website. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Vaishali. As you can see, and we'll include in a wrap-up email after the webinar, we'll include um, some of the resources that Dr. Middleman mentioned. Uh, we'll include a link to the overall um, findings for this study as well that Vaishali just spoke through. So you find it all in one place for those of you who are looking for those resources. But thank you, Vaishali. And, and, and next, I will turn it to Tosin and Oscar to share their findings also from, from a recent survey they conducted. Thank you so much, Mariana. So good day, everyone. Um, today we're presenting a brief research update on parents and healthcare providers views on shared clinical decision-making for meningococcal group B vaccines. My name is Tosin Alaya. Um, I'm a US Medical Affairs Director at GSK Vaccines. And today I'm in the company of my colleague, Oscar Herrera, who is a US Health Economics and Outcomes Research Director also at GSK Vaccines. Next slide, please. Before going over our topic of interest, I just want to acknowledge this disclaimer, which states that this presentation does not include products or brand-specific information, it provides guidance for safety reporting and confirms that GSK funded the content of this presentation. Next slide. As we've heard briefly um, earlier, I just wanted to set the stage again, just to bring us all to the same page. Um, a quick overview on meningococcal vaccination in the US. Um, two vaccine types are currently recommended to help protect against meningococcal disease. If we look at the age-based recommendations, we have men ACWY vaccines, being routinely recommended to healthy adolescents with the first dose at 11 to 12 years of age and a booster dose at age 16. Men B vaccines are also recommended on their shared clinical decision making in a two dose series at age 16 to 23, with the preferred age being 16 to 18 years. 
Both vaccines are also recommended based on risk for meningococcal disease, as for example, patients with asplenia, complement uh, component deficiency, and HIV only for men ACWY. Next slide, please. So thinking of shared clinical decision-making for men B, it is important to emphasize what it means. If you look at the center of this visual, it means that HCPs, parents and patients come together to make a joint decision where parents and all patients express and know what is important to them and HCPs know the science behind the disease and vaccines that are available to prevent it. We recently conducted two surveys on meningococcal disease and vaccination knowledge, attitudes and practices. One of them was among young adults and parents of adolescents 16 to 18 years old, and the other among men B vaccinators. While we understand that the meningococcal vaccines recommendations are evolving and they may evolve further, this research sheds light on knowledge and attitudes affecting how doctors, teens, and parents understand meningococcal disease and vaccination in a way that will remain relevant even as the recommendations evolve. And to give more details on what we found, Oscar will take over from this point forward. Thank you, Tosin. Next slide, please. So let me start with the survey that look at and understanding parents and young adults' attitudes and perspective from meningococcal disease. Keep in mind that there will be lots of data in the next slides, but I want to I want you to remember that uh, what I want you to remember is that disease awareness gaps persist among parents and patients, and that the role of ACPs in initiating MENB conversations and vaccination is critical. Going over some details, this was an online survey with participants randomly recruited from a US-based panel during September and October 2022. And the study participants' breakdown was kept similar between the parents and the young adults and across men B vaccination status. Next slide, please. Moving to some results, uh, this figure shows us that disease awareness can be low, especially across the non-vaccinated cohorts, which is not surprising, and it emphasizes existing knowledge gaps for sure. It is important to mention here that we use the term meningitis to signify invasive meningococcal disease, as the respondents were thought to be more familiar with this term. Next slide, please. Now, looking at the figure on the left, and as expected, parents tend to find vaccination as the best protection against the disease more than young adults, regardless men be vaccination status. Mariana, if you click one more, if we turn to this figure on the right, parents also agree more on the severe impact of meningitis than young adults. All this certainly points to opportunities to provide targeted education on disease prevention to young adults. Next slide, please. Now, going back to chair clinical decision making for MenB vaccines, looking at these two pie charts, we can see that physicians initiated the conversation more frequently than parents of MenB vaccinated adolescents or vaccinated young adults. The list on the right also shows us that over half of parents, Mariana, if you click once more, over half of parents or young adults reported that the top reason to initiate the MenB vaccination conversation was about school or college requirements. And more than half of MenB vaccinated respondents were unaware of what your clinical decision making means. Next slide, please. So now that we have discussed knowledge and attitudes gaps among parents and patients, let me briefly touch on what we found on during our ACP survey. This was also an online survey with participants randomly recruited from US panels of physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants from April to May 2022 for physicians and from September to October 2022 for other HCPs, with the study participant breakdown as shown in the figures. Next slide, please. Starting with the results on top, and Mariana, if you click once more, we can see that half of the physicians did not know that zero group B currently causes the highest proportion of meningococcal disease in 16 to 23 year olds in the US, along with over half of them not knowing that men B vaccine recommendation is under chair clinical decision making, which wouldn't be necessarily bad if they handle men B vaccination as routine, but it would be if they are not having conversations about men B vaccination. Of course, further research would be needed to clarify this. Now, looking at the results at the bottom of this slide, 
and following the color code in the screen for physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants who are MENV vaccinators, we see that 75% or more of them reported always or almost always discussing MENV vaccination, where physicians especially initiated the conversation in a higher proportion versus parents, patients, nurses, or other staff. Next slide, please. Finally, we also found that almost a third of physicians vaccinating for MENB be believe that shared clinical decision-making introduces confusion among patients and physicians, which brings us to the second set of results in this slide on prior training about implementing shared clinical decision-making. Here we see that over 75% of physicians had received some training or other information. However, over half of these physicians reported self-training using published vaccination guidelines. Next slide. So to wrap up, I just want to leave you with three highlights. First, there are gaps in the awareness of meningococcal disease among parents and young adults. Second, knowledge gaps also persist among ACPs regarding meningococcal disease epidemiology and vaccination recommendations. And third, physicians and other ACPs usually initiate MEMBI conversations, which suggests that if conversations are not initiated by then, patients and parents may not have access to appropriate vaccine information. Also, please recall that there are differences in initiating MEMBI conversations by provider type. So within all this context, targeted patient and parent education on short clinical decision-making and targeted training of physicians and other ACPs to help improve knowledge of meningococcal disease and understanding of vaccine recommendations could help to close these currently identified gaps. And the last slide, please, Mariana. I just want to say thank you on behalf of GSK and leave you with this set of links of the data related to our presentation and contact information in case of follow-up questions. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Tosin. And I know we have thrown quite a bit at all of you, lots of different data uh, around where we stand today, what things are looking like in the future. And so next, we're going to jump into our panel. And this is really an opportunity for us to dive into some of these topics a little bit more. Um, I also want to introduce Amy Pisani, who you haven't heard from yet. She's a chief executive officer of Vaccinate Your, Your Family. And um, I'll turn it over to Amy, actually, to kick us off with our, our first question. Um, Amy, I know you work across a wide range of vaccines, meningitis included. Um, if we think a little bit about the policy side of things, um, whether it's ACIP or other policy related stakeholders, knowing the changes that are coming and some of the challenges that we face today, what do you think are some good best practices that we can share with the advocates that are on the call in terms of, of engaging these policymakers? Thank you. I really appreciate that question. And I, and I know that the folks who are on the call, we're all here for the same reason we all want to see our children getting meningitis vaccine. And I think that um, I want to really want to thank Alicia and Patty and the work that you do is just, I don't know how you do it because you're right. We should not have a world meningitis day. We need to get this covered. Then we need to help the rest of the world. Um, that being said, there's a lot that goes into making these decisions. And I, and vaccinate your family does have a policy. We do support the recommendations of the advisory committee of immunization practices. We feel this is incredibly important to, to state because these are independent authorities that are looking at the data and trying to determine the best course of action for our nation. That being said, I don't think it's too bold to say it, that the meningitis B program has been a complete failure. We have not vaccinated our children with the, these, with these critical life-saving vaccines. And part of that is because we are not, as public health figures, valuing the, the power of vaccines. How can we expect the rest of the nation to believe that prevention is more important than treating a disease if we as public health folks are not speaking from the same page? And so when we make a decision about shared, um, shared clinical decision-making and the quality figures that come out, I know they're important and, and, and Alicia and, and Patty and our friend Lynn and Frankie have done an amazing job bringing people to the meetings to really show the impact of, of what happens when you contract meningococcal disease of any kind. But we have to stop talking about saving money for the nation. We need to save people. 
they all matter. They all matter. Um, so that's that's sort of where I am, you know, where we are with the ACIP situation. Um, when it comes to policymakers, well, it's a really sticky situation as well, because we want to make sure that um, we don't see an erosion in authority among, policy, among, among public health officials. And so we don't necessarily want to see policymakers jumping into the bandwagon and saying which vaccine should be recommended, which one shouldn't be, of course, but there's a lot that policymakers can be doing. And so at the local level, um, really reaching out to your legislators and making sure they understand that they need to fund vaccines and delivery. Uh, they need to visibly support vaccinations. Um, they need to be talking about, you know, what it is that that is a barrier to their constituents. If Mississippi has some of the lowest vaccination rates for meningococcal, um, B, A, C, W, Y, and Iowa has the greatest, what is it, where is that, where is that line happening? And what can the policymakers do to make sure that everyone has equitable access to the vaccines? And then I think, um, and I know Alicia and Patty have done a lot of work on this, requiring those vaccines for college. I mean, when my kids went to college, there was a mishap. Of course, my kids are vaccinated. There was a big pink sticker on one of their folders that said they can't come in on, on, on day one because you don't have the meninge B. Of course I did, um, but it was during the pandemic and there was a little mishap in the communication, but like my state made it a priority. Can other states do the same? And I think that's where the policymakers can really, really come into play. Thanks, Amy. Dr. Middleman, Alicia, would you add anything to that? So I, I want to kind of just address a couple points. I also do support, um, though I don't agree with it, um, the ACIP's recommendation. I unfortunately think that the um, ACIP's recommendation on the men B vaccine um, has made it um, a cluster F. <laughs> of, of a very um, okay vaccine. Is it an excellent vaccine? No, but it was the best we had at the time and it would prevent deaths. And what it created, um, you know, I, just as a quick aside, you know, when I knew I wanted to begin to do this kind of work after my daughter died and I didn't want to just be the mother of a dead kid, I did go back to school and received my master's of public health because my MBA didn't give me any credentials to talk about vaccine vac or, or anything medical. So, and one of my big takeaways from, from public health, learning about public health is that in the United States, our public health is, um, is inequitable and that just isn't okay. And I, I feel like this is 2023, we live in the United States of America. And I, I maybe we're not inequitably distributing it um, in terms of dollars, who has, who doesn't, because we do make it available. It is covered by VFC. However, we are distributing this vaccine um, to the knowledge haves and we are not distributing it to the knowledge nots. And that is inequitable and that is not okay. And my concern about PICO-1, one of my concerns about PICO-1, there's a couple, um, is that um, we are still going to be distributing this knowledge to the knowledge haves. And um, I have been told very boldly by pediatricians, um, we just don't have the room, the resources to stock extra vaccines when they are not fully recommended, when they're optional. And that's concerning to me because it isn't optional. Shared clinical decision-making doesn't mean optional. And, um, and, and again, it's all feeding into the, the inequitable distribution. And that's really, really concerning. And I, I'm, I fear that this next vaccine, um, having to stack three separate vaccines in their refrigerator um, is going to add to that. I can't tell you how many calls I get um, from people that, especially when it was first introduced, they I, I could go on parent group, I could raise awareness and, and they could go and get the vaccine. They could say, I, I need a men B vaccine. I'm told there's another vaccine and, and their kid ends up with a third dose of ACWY. It's, is that what's going to happen? Because they really don't know. So 
Yeah, I, I would actually echo what you both have said and say that, um, you know, as you as you know, with the, from the public health perspective, these some of these decisions become um, very different from what we would do as an individual provider. And for, as an individual provider, my job is to take care of the patient in front of me, and I'm a strong believer in vaccinating and preventing disease. So I think one of the most important things is to make sure through educational materials, et cetera, all providers are aware of this vaccine and that all of them understand um, the, the benefit over risk um, approach for that vaccine. And um, from a public health perspective, it's really difficult sometimes to sort of weigh these decisions. And But, but I do think there is a... Um, a really significant problem talking about this in terms of dollars. I just don't think it translates. I just, I just don't. And it's just really painful every time the conversation goes in that direction. So you know, I, I, I agree with you and, and Amy, I agree with you because you brought up that point too. You know, I often wonder, you know, these decision makers, you know, is it a value that you put on a child's life, you know, because my daughter's life was more than that. Any of those numbers that are in, in the PICO um, you know, spreadsheet, my daughter's life to, to me and to my family was, was more than any of those values. Yeah, and I think that when, when those values are created, again, I don't think they in any way actually account for the essence, the soul of the person the impact on every family member, every friend, every teacher, every coach, every there is a lot lost, tremendous, tremendous loss. And I, I agree with you. I don't know how to how to and, do I, that. and, and to be clear, we, the people that make up the ACIP are the most amazing public health servants in the nation. They are. They get it. They get it. But we have a mindset in our nation that does not value prevention. And if we right. don't stop talking about dollars for prevention, that's not a conversation we're having with other medical products. And, you know, we talk about the people that were lost like Kimberly and Emily and, and Ryan. And, and, you know, I think about so many um, children, but we've got also Carl and Sam and, and survivors and the cost that, that they are incurring for their ongoing medical care. Yes. Is, yeah. I don't know that you can really so right. put a value on that either. Yeah. I agree. And I agree with you, Amy, as well. I mean, I sit as, as part of the outer circle of ASIP and the people who make these decisions are, um, they really are amazing, knowledgeable, empathetic parents. <laughs> and for the most part, you know, they they do get it. It's, it's painful every time a decision um, that isn't a wholehearted routine recommendation. It's painful every time. It's painful for them, I'm sure. And Amy, I wanted to plug in with a question here. You, you three are very easy to moderate a panel. You moderate yourselves. So that's great. Uh, but one follow-up question on the cost effectiveness piece. And then, of course, welcome any other builds and thoughts on that as well. That is a question we get often. Um, we understand why that is a key consideration. But as advocates, we'd like to be able to do something to address that. Um, obviously, few of us, if any, have the resources to conduct our own studies around cost effectiveness or do something similar along those lines. Any recommendations on how advocates can be having more kind of, um, let's say, kind of more helpful discussions that will actually move the needle when it comes to having cost effectiveness discussions with whether it's ACIP or other policymakers? And we talked a little bit about equity, and I think that We'll talk about that. I, I think we'll talk a little bit more about it. But when you think about the the cost effectiveness, I again, we're not talking about the right topic. There's an equity problem in our nation. And so if their completion rate is in the teens, I'm thinking that mostly public health people are the ones getting our kids vaccinated because I don't know who else is. And so I think that we need to really kind of shift that language and say, if we're talking about equity among vaccinations across the nation, what is the cost to your community? Or go to a go to a, a policymaker and say, this is what it cost when we had the outbreak. What was it 2019? To, I forget the exact years, but 
what did it cost when when 30 schools ended up getting uh, having outbreaks what was the cost to your community and I mean, I remember when Lynn um, Bozoff brought us all together with some of the presidents from the universities where the outbreaks had occurred, they were devastated, devastated that the children in their schools had contracted and, and died of meningitis and how that affected their school and all of the work that they had to do in order to mitigate. I think maybe that's part of the cost effectiveness that we should talk a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Any thoughts on that, Alicia and Amy? You know, for me, I think um, a, a, a good moving forward, you know, area for us is going to be when we see what the actual recommendation is, though we we all sitting here and moderating do have a pretty good idea, you know, training more advocates, more people to talk about it is, is so important. That's, you know, from our um from, from our perspective that we have a training session next week where we're bringing in advocates for from all over the country that, to work with us and empowering them with this knowledge also. And, you know, our B team and keeping them educated is just really important and, and especially with the changing landscape. Yeah, and, you know, I think, you know, um, Amy referred to the work that Lynn and um, other advocates had at, at ASIP. It's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. Being on Zoom has hurt that, I think. It's really mm -hmm. hard. You know, Zoom has its limitations, right? This webinar has its limitations versus actually all being in person together and reading each other's body language and seeing each other's expressions of pain, joy, whatever. Um, I don't know how to fix that, but um, I think we have to be creative um, in, in terms and shift the way we advocate at this point. Um, I, I don't know how to make it work better for a faceless voice on Zoom. I just, yeah. it's, it's different now. You're right. Yeah, You're right. yeah, that's completely true. And I think I want to, I do want to be conscious of, of time. We have about two minutes left, um, but Dr. Middleman, you know, I know from the Meningitis B Action Project perspective, we like to talk as much as possible as it says in our name in terms of kind of like tangible actions that we can take. And there are these kind of longer term shifts that we're hoping to be able to influence and guide a certain way when it comes to certain recommendations. But at the moment, talking about shared clinical decision making, and even in, in the context of, you know, pentavalent sounds like regardless of the recommendation that comes out will also be shared clinical decision making to a certain point. You talked a little bit about this, but any kind of words of advice to the providers who are on the call in terms of what is the best way to have that discussion, the most effective kind of approach to take um, in order to, to to have these discussions with both the, the patient as well as their parent in the case of meningitis? Uh, that's a great question and it's a difficult one because I think the mo first most important thing is to get the information out, right? That this is a, that this vaccine has been approved and that we need to start using it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I would like to see more educational materials, frankly, for all vaccines. And, and there's a lot of information available on immunize.org and cdc.gov and, you know, Amy's website. All these websites have wonderful information. I just don't know how many providers access it. But it's really important that providers feel comfortable initiating the conversation because they have to educate their parents. And in order to do that, it is really important. Know a couple of bullet points about the disease the key bullet points about the disease, know a couple of key bullet points about the vaccines, the safety and the efficacy, and know how to approach the patient in terms of making the vaccination relevant for them. The first two are easy, right? You put them in your mind, you repeat them over and over again with patient after patient. And then the third one is your connection with the patient. Why do I think it's really important for you to get this vaccine? because it's going to protect you. I want all of the all the protection you can have when you go to college. I vaccinated my children. I, I, I share very little about my personal life with patients, with the exception of the fact that I have vaccinated all of my children against all diseases that I can potentially prevent. Um, 
and I think it's really important to be a be comfortable being vulnerable in a conversation. If you don't know, if you don't know it, that's not the main point. What parents are asking you for is the information that you have, and would you vaccinate your child? And we can give them that information. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's that's where I'm coming from. Amy, you might have some other thoughts. Um, I leave the providers to you. I know they're incredibly busy, and I know share clinical decision making can be very stressful. We've got COVID vaccines, flu vaccines, Tdap, meningococcal. I mean, so much going on. So whatever we can do to help the providers in this journey is critical. It is. It, it really is because if people are overwhelmed in the primary care world. Just if we can just arm them with two bullets, two bullets, two bullets, we're good. I think it's going to be, it'll open up the conversation and that's where we'll get progress. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank you all so much for joining. There are so many other questions we wanted to get to, but we didn't get to all of them. Um, any closing thoughts or kind of closing words of advice, be it to providers or to advocates that our panel would like to, to share? I'm praying for the panovalent. Yeah, I say. we are also, we are also. Yes. And I just want to thank the the Men Be Action Project really for putting this on and, and creating this kind of awareness. This is what will really help as well. So I appreciate it so very much. And again, thank, thank you all for being here. Um, participants, panelists, speakers, we really, really appreciate your support. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And I know we're out of time. Um, we don't want to keep you longer than we promised. So there are a few kind of comments, questions that came in in the Q&A in terms of are the surveys representative of the population surveyed, et cetera. So um, we will be in touch with those responses. Any other questions that you have, feel free to share them here on info at meningitis B. Um, actionprojects.org and we'll get back to you as, as soon as possible. Appreciate your, your both for the, the panelists, the speakers, those who took the time to log in, appreciate all your input and, and questions. We hope this is helpful and just the start of what's to come, as Alicia mentioned, in terms of other future trainings that we'd like to have, updated materials that integrate pentovalent, et cetera, but we have to start somewhere. So hopefully this was a good start. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank Have you, everyone. Bye-bye.